Oh. Captain and Sunil. Sean Cassidy. And special guest star, the chick who sang Lovin' You. That's Maya Rudolph's mother. Let's sing Lovin' You together right now, <laughs> just to set the mood for this great episode. Let's Lovin' You. It's easy because you're beautiful. Oh. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Never mind. Morons. And now it's time for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Wears a sweater vest and seems aggressively asexual. And Rish Outfield. You are an intelligent woman. Happy Christmas, Harry. <laughs> Happy Christmas, Ron. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Okay, I'm not doing an accent the whole way through. <laughs> oh. Episode 120. Are you sure? Yeah. Mm, I think you need to count the episodes again and see if this is it. Exactly. Okay, let's see. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Oh, no more singing, please. Do, yeah. do, 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 do. Times that by ten and we get 120, so that should be right. Okay, I, I'm not a math genius or any kind of genius. Well, I could just sing that song ten times in a row and count them all up if you prefer. Oh, I do prefer, sir. <laughs> Go. That was lame even for you. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to the show, folks. Happy holidays. If you're still listening and haven't already switched it off. It's time for another insufferable episode of the Doonstief Welcome to Hell. Yes. Announcer man, you are here with us. I don't think we gave you uh, much attention last week or the week before or the week before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But hey, thank you for joining us again, Announcer Man. I know that it's the holidays and you had places that you needed to be. Announcer Man, at your uh, service. But right. like loyal Bob Cratchit, <laughs> here he is. I suppose you'll be wanting the whole day. <laughs> be here all the earlier the next day this is a special episode in a way specials uglies pretties <laughs> go. extras episode why don't sorry why don't you go ahead and introduce it all right today's story is the sad magic spider i'm i'm, I'm sorry what, what what was that i said it is the sad magic, magic spider, spider! Singing again. That's my cue to leave. Sorry, I can't say it without singing it. <laughs> By Scott Westerfeld. Wow. He shoots. He scores. So, uh, here we go, folks. Um, How about you guys tell me about today's author? Scott Westerfeld was born in Texas in 1963. He studied at Vassar College and has worked as a software designer and composer and is now a full-time writer. His first novel, Polymorph, was published in 1997 and was followed by Fine Prey, Evolution's Darling. A New York Times notable book shortlisted for the Philip K. Dick Award. Thank you, Rich. And The Risen Empire. His novels for teenagers include the Midnighters trilogy, The Secret Hour, Touching Darkness, and Blue Noon. Thanks again, Rich. <laughs> as well as So Yesterday, Peeps. The Last Day, Uglies, Pretties, Specials, and Extras. Westerfeld has also contributed essays to Book Forum, Nerve, and the scientific journal Nature. He and fellow writer Justine Larbalastier divide their time between New York, Sydney, and Mexico. Visit his website at www.scottwesterfeld.com. Asshat Magic Spider by Scott Westerfeld Four hours before takeoff, I was in the gym. Two t-shirts to catch the sweat, a plastic slicker over that, and a hoodie on top of everything. I was the only person in that corner of the gym, the one with floor-to-ceiling windows, and the aircon was hardly denting the sunlight streaming in. Of course, the sun wasn't hitting my skin all covered up like that. Direct sunlight keeps you from sweating, which is why desert nomads wear long robes. 
There on that stair climber, I imagined myself a Bedouin crossing the Sahara, looking for somewhere to fill my canteen. But I guess there aren't too many stairs in the desert, and I bet Bedouins don't wear black hoodies. And I knew it was about 100% certain I'd never see the Sahara. Of course, Tau 4 has its own deserts, and we can name them whatever we want. The New Sahara, the Asshat Desert, that big sandy place over there. That morning I'd weighed myself, hoping that I'd mystically shed four and a half pounds while I'd slept. Or, as I was supposed to start saying once we got to Tau 4, two kilos. No such luck. Me and Charlotte were still 1,700 grams overweight. Crap. So I cursed the extra three inches I'd grown that year and sat down to a hearty breakfast of one tablespoon, oops, eight grams of peanut butter. For dessert, I gargled with water. Sweet, sweet water. Source of life and three quarters of my horrible, unlosable weight. Here's a trick. If you gargle, your throat won't know you're dehydrated. Just make sure you spit the water out. Next, I put some sunscreen on my lips to keep them from cracking. If the colony ship docks thought I'd been cutting too much weight before the launch, they'd hook me up to an IV and pump me back to hydration. Maybe add as much as half a kilo of water and sugar to my mass. And that would mean leaving Charlotte behind. Two hours before the weigh-in, I checked myself again. The scale at the gym was mega-sensitive, almost as precise as the machine I'd be facing at the weigh-in. It showed me still 400 grams over, even after I'd stripped down to shorts. Of course, about 100 grams of that was the sweaty shorts, but that was almost exactly what Charlotte weighed. So the two balanced out. I was still screwed. The hair had to go. Now, as you know from pictures, a lot of colonists were shaving their heads. And shaving a lot more, which at 13, thankfully wasn't an issue for me. A few of them had even plucked their eyebrows so they could bring another gram of diamonds, or private diary storage, or hundred-year-old whiskey along. But those first few weeks on Tau were going to include a lot of hard physical labor. Everyone knew. And evolution put those eyebrows up there to keep the sweat out of your eyes. Remove them at your own risk. By that time, I hated the sauna for smelling like chlorine and desperation, and for curling up all my books as I read them for the last time. So I did the deed in the shower, clumsily chopping at my shoulder-length hair with scissors, then shaving the rest. From the mirror, a horrible fish boy stared back at me, an appalled expression on his face. Blood oozed from a few spots, which grossed me out until I realized that blood must weigh something. Clever me. Bleeding. And the whole time I was thinking about how my mom was going to freak. She'd made me promise not to do this. But what was she going to do? Ground me? I was stuck inside a spaceship for the next two subjective years anyway, not to mention being a popsicle. After the hair massacre, on went fresh t-shirts and plastic pullover and hoodie, the hood of which now rubbed freakily against my bare and sweating head. And I climbed more stairs until it was time for my appointment. The whole time my imagination ran rampant with feasts of potatoes and toast covered with jam, cheeseburgers and apple pie, anything but peanut butter, plain lettuce, and salt-free pickles. And for dessert, Giant glasses of water, swallowed all the way down to the cracking desert at my core. But on my last trip to the scale, I found I'd hit the target and pulled Charlotte out of my bag for a little victory dance. For those last weeks, I remembered this golden rule. Every bite of food was actually massive amounts of rocket fuel. Here's how it works. Every gram that goes to Tau requires five grams of fuel to get it up to light speed. This is one-fifth Isaac Newton's fault, and the rest is because of the inefficiency of the colony's ship engines. But it doesn't end there. You see, the ship doesn't burn its fuel all at the beginning of the trip. So the fuel it's burning, say, halfway there, has to be brought along. 
which means the ship needs more fuel to push that fuel that far in the first place, see? On top of which, you need fuel to move the fuel that carries the fuel. And then, when you finally get halfway to Tau 4, you're going to need the same amount of fuel to slow you down, so you don't whip past your goal. So you have to count on all the extra fuel to get that fuel halfway there, and all the infrastructure to move all this fuel around, and spare parts and crew to fix all this infrastructure when it breaks, all of which need more fuel to push them all the way to Tau system. Every gram of passenger or luggage turns into kilos and kilos of fission stuff. And that's why I was cutting weight. When you see pictures of the Santa Maria, you'd think it would be so huge and luxurious inside. Guess what? It was one big fuel tank with a tiny box attached full of short, skinny, hungry, hairless colonists. After much debate, the weight limit was fixed per person, your body weight and any luggage combined, no matter what size you are. Everyone has the same number of genes, they said, and that's all that counts when it comes to long-term survivability. Tall and fat people need not apply. So most of the colonists were short. My mom's really short, and I was too back when we took our immigration tests. Didn't count on growing three inches, 7.5 centimeters, excuse me for living, in the year since then. And every centimeter I grew meant throwing away one more thing from my personal allowance. My Sennheiser earbuds, my pen and paper diary, even the old chemical photo of my tall, jeaned father, all of them cut. All I had left was Charlotte. I would have been sweating if there had been any H2O left in me. The guy looked like a wrestler with no neck and a body that was way over the colonist limit. He must have hated us. At his size, he was never getting any closer to Tau 4 than this shuttle pad. He looked at me, naked and clutching Charlotte to my chest, and scowled. Damn, you're skinny. I tried to shrug. I grew a lot this year. Let me see your hand, kid. I reached out, not quite sure what he was up to and trying to ignore the fact that my fingers were shaking. He gripped the webbing between my thumb and forefinger and pinched brutally. Ow! Shut up! He peered at the webbing, which had turned a horrible pale color in the weigh-in room's bright lights. It took several long seconds to turn pink again. You're dehydrated, he pronounced. I'm not! He snorted and pulled a plastic cup from the stand beside the scale. You want to pee in this for me, kid? I swallowed. After a week of seriously cutting weight, you don't pee a lot. And when you do, it's yellow and nasty and burns like Tabasco coming out. I just went, you know, didn't want to be over. I said this casually, like the whole weight thing had only occurred to me five minutes ago though my bald and scabby head was kind of a giveaway. He let out a long hiss through his teeth. You colonists. Luckiest people on the planet, and still you gotta steal. Steal? I'm not stealing anything. Think about it, kid. You're gonna eat like a pig when you wake up. And that food is weight that had to be carried there. More fuel that us on Earth had to pay for. Yeah, well... I hadn't thought about it that way. Or rather... I had, but then my mom had explained why she was dieting to bring another few grams of diamonds. Everybody's doing it. It's kind of like built into the formula. He snorted. If you weren't just a kid, I'd call the docs and have you hooked up. He gestured at Charlotte. Then you'd have to leave that. What the hell is that anyway? I didn't react, and he snapped his fingers. Slowly, and with a horrible feeling that he was going to get finger grease all over Charlotte and make her slightly heavier, I handed her over. He let out a laugh. <laughs> An old book? Yeah, I said. I used to have hundreds of them. That's the last one. Collector, huh? Reader. Familiar with the concept? He laughed again. <laughs> hey, don't get all tough on me, kid. I might get scared and have to snap your dehydrated little ass in half. Kind of like a pretzel stick. Or would you be all chewy inside, like beef jerky? He rifled through the pages. Come on, kid. 
You're all smart and stuff. Passed all those tests. What do you think dehydrated guts would look like? I think you're an asshat, I said. He looked straight at me, a faint smirk on his face. I held his stare, which was pretty tricky, what with me being naked and hairless and trying to steal from humanity. But I won the staring contest. And finally he let out a sigh, handing back Charlotte. On the scale, kid. He wasn't going to bust me. I swallowed, my parched throat crinkling like wrapping paper inside me, and stepped on. The red number spun in front of my eyes for a second, then steadied. Fifteen grams over. What? But the scale at the gym said... He sighed. Yeah, been hearing that one all day. But that's not fair! Hmm, I suppose not. But you know what? This scale is calibrated to the one that the universe uses. The one that will decide whether you lucky colonists will wake up on Tau, or just float like popsicles for eternity. So if I were you, I'd be glad this scale was a little better than the one in the gym. But what am I supposed to do? I cried. He handed me a plastic cup. Spit. Or pee, I don't care. Fifteen grams ain't much. I tried to spit, but my mouth was as dry as the asshat desert. You want me to make you cry, kid? Tears must weigh something. I scowled at him, realizing that my eyes were in fact burning, but I was too dehydrated to turn my anger and shame into salt water. Salt traps water weight, and I hadn't eaten anything salty in a month. I can't spit. He shrugged. Why you need that book anyway? It'll be in the ship's memory, even if it's porn. It's not porn. And it's not the same in memory. He pulled it from me again and flipped through the pages. Must be some book. What's it about, anyway? A spider, I said. And a pig. Sounds kinky. <laughs> he chuckled. And you're sure it's not porn? No. I mean, yes, I'm sure. Uh... I groaned. A few more minutes with this guy and I was going to cry. I wondered how many tears were 15 grams. So, what's it about? I wondered if I was losing weight just standing here. My anger and frustration burning away the micrograms. The pig is going to get eaten at Christmas, and the spider makes a web saying it's great. What's great? Getting eaten? No, the pig. Like, the spider puts a message in the web saying, Terrific, so nobody eats the pig. So the spider's magic? No, the spider's not magic. So how come it knows how to spell? I sighed. Well, I guess it's sort of magic, but not in a major way. It just makes the web because it has to, otherwise the pig's going to get eaten. And the spider cares about this pig, why? <sighs> because they're friends, I said. My eyes were burning like chili peppers now, but still no tears came. He leafed through the book some more. Look, whatever, kid. I admit this thing's got a nice feel. Never read anything this way myself, but you could pull the covers off, you know? That would cut some weight. All the words will still be there. I clenched my fists. No, I'm not pulling the covers off. He fondled the dust jacket. Hey, this paper wrapper comes off. That might help. Put that back. I'm not taking it without the dust jacket. And look, there's all these pages before the story starts. And a bunch of blank ones at the end. Man, they had trees to burn back then. You could tear those out. I'm not tearing anything out, okay? We've got to find a way to make me weigh less, not the book. What if I hold my breath? He <laughs> laughed. The air in your lungs doesn't oddly weigh anything, kid. He looked at his watch. And I don't have all day. Got a shuttle to load. I looked down at my fingernails, which were already cut down to the quick. I wished I had hair on my arms or chest so I could shave that off right now. I visualized myself running a few more dozen flights of stairs or eating one less tablespoon of peanut butter, hoping my brain could burn the calories with imaginary exercise. Listen, kid. The next time you wake up, you're going to be a hundred years of light speed travel from the nearest other bunch of humans on a planet that can barely support you. No hospitals, no police, no one to call for help. And this is the kind of book you want to bring? One about magic spiders? 
That's exactly the book I want to bring, I said. And finally, I realized that I was going to have to tear Charlotte up and leave part of her behind. She was first edition, perfect except for the slightest foxing on the upper left of page 86. And I felt a single hot tear float down my cheek. I started to reach for it. Don't, kid. He grabbed my wrist. Your fingertips are so dry they'll suck it back up. And he reached out and flicked the tear from my face with his thumb. Then he handed me the book. Get on the scale again. Doesn't matter. I closed my eyes, wondering if ripping off just the back cover would be enough. No tear is going to weigh 15 grams. Quit wasting my time, kid. Get on the scale. He held out his hand and pulled me on. My head was already dizzy from all the exercise that morning, from a week of dehydration and my nerves about the launch, and from the fact that my collection had gone from whole shelves full to just one book. And now, that was going to be mutilated. I didn't notice at first that he hadn't let go of my hand. Hey, look, kid. You're right on target. I opened my eyes. The red numbers weren't quite steady, but they shimmered just under the allowance. My hand, resting in his, felt the slightest upward pressure. He clicked a foot switch, nailing the red numbers right where they belonged. Okay, kid. Get your butt on board. I stepped off, then paused for a moment, wondering if this was really a good idea. What about the universe? What about slowing down on the other side? He laughed. <laughs> Last few guys before you were under by a few grams. Most people are. Your mom's right. It is kind of worked into the formula. But we couldn't tell anybody that. Oh. But why did you... Why me? He laughed. <laughs> because I'm an asshat magic spider, kid. And you were the saddest little pig I ever saw. So, yeah. That's the other story I've been meaning to tell you. It's probably why I've read you this one novel so many times, even though your mom thinks it'll turn you into a vegetarian. And why you're called Wilbur, instead of some name you'd probably like a lot more. And it's also why you don't get to touch this book. THE book. The only real one on this whole planet, I'll have you know. Until you're old enough not to get finger grease on it. Because it's a perfect book. Except for the slight foxing on page 86. And it's at exactly the right weight right now. Author's Note While I was traveling for a few months recently, a friend stayed in my apartment. Upon my return, I found he'd left a scale behind in the bathroom. I started stepping onto it during the day, watching my weight change as things came and went from my body. I was more variable than I'd thought, pounds arriving and departing like subway trains. It occurred to me that in certain situations, like space travel, exact mass is very important. Every gram must be accounted for. And every time you sweat, spit, cut your hair, or blow your nose, your mass changes. So I began to wonder what space-exploring colonists might go through to leave behind just a little more of themselves if it meant they could bring along just a bit more cargo. Which brought up the question, what possession would it be worth diminishing your own body to keep? This story is my answer to that question. Ass hat magic spider. Ass hat. After the story, the cast list. Cast list. There wasn't much as far as cast goes in this story. It was just me as the main character slash narrator. You as the ass hat magic spider. Yes. And oh, who do we have to thank for this? So who who produced this episode, Big? Uh, I actually produced it myself. Okay. I produced so, it uh, myself, uh, uh, I says. No, you didn't. Myself, no. myself, I did. You don't produce for the show anymore. <laughs> who produced this show? Was it, uh, was it Scott Pig? <laughs> you would think because, by the you know, amazing quality on this. Oh, okay. Marshall Latham come out of retirement to do this? <laughs> Fat chance of that happening. Well, then maybe it was Renee Chambliss because she's been out of the picture for a long uh, time. She's got one coming up here soon, but 
Well, okay, now just, just tell me. We won't even have to air it. Uh, uh, R-O-8-O-T, feel free to cut this when the truth is told. Who really produced this episode? Yeah, it was me, I'm afraid. Stop it. The that's, joke isn't funny anymore. That's Yes, it isn't. That's true. All right, moving on. <laughs> uh, had magic spider! Whoa! See, yes. I have a bad feeling that that's not the last time that little song is going to be sang. <laughs> I don't know. Where, where did that even come from? I guess now is a good time to tell the whole story of this whole story. You see, son, when a man and a woman love each other very much. <laughs> that's right. Or a sailor is on leave. He. <laughs> <laughs> this story, how did it make it onto our show, is kind of a, a long. Sordid tale. Yeah, a long trek, a long journey. But we don't say goodbye on the show. We, we say, say good, good journey. journey. That's right. It'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. And it was a good journey. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Uh, this story, I think, came out probably two or three years ago. How long have we been doing the show? For three years? Maybe... Bah? Maybe 2008 or so this story came out. After that year was over. Wait, wait, feedback. Wait. No. <laughs> after wait, the... it came out in 2008... And you happened to see it right then? or No, I didn't happen to see it right then, but after the year was over, and it was now 2009, I believe, and, and the years could be off on this. I, I admittedly could be remembering it wrong. Well, well let's, let's but, just compromise and say it was the year three okay. that it came out. In the year three it came out, and then in the year four, I happened to see the uh, post, like right after the Hugos are done, they published this report on how all the voting went. Right. And it'll oh, give really? You, and that's just public for people to see? Yeah, anybody can download it and check it out, and it'll give you the final vote numbers that all the different stories got. And so they'll show you how many votes the ones, the five finalists got and stuff. And then also, and I just happened to see this. I don't know how I came across it, but I just happened to be looking, and I found it. Also, it gives you all the other votes for the nominations. And I saw all these stories, and I thought, gosh, that would be a way to find good stories to read, right? Is to check out these stories that are in this whole nomination thing. And so I was going through and reading stories that had been nominated, and this story, Ass Hat Magic Spider, was one of them. And I read it, and I thought, God, I like this story. This story okay, is just... Okay, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt. Why did you read it? Was it because of the title, or did you know who Scott Westerfeld was? I didn't know Scott Westerfeld. I was actually introduced to Scott Westerfeld by way of this story. It was the title. It was one of those things where you look at it, and you're like, okay, I got to find out what this is all about. You can't see a story named Asshat Magic Spider and just be like, eh, I could probably take that or leave it. You know, you, you, you got to find out, and so I did. And, uh, yeah, it turned out to be a great story that I really enjoyed. And so I decided, yeah, there's got to be some way that we can get this story. And uh, I think then and there I started uh, emailing Scott. You know, this was way before I ever learned my lesson to uh, turn off the rich text formatting that you get in your email where you type in, we are from the Doonstief magazine at doonstief.com, and then automatically that turns into a link and then that email automatically goes to the writer's spam folder. It was a while before I finally learned how to uh, get beyond that and make the email a pure text thing so that it wasn't until two years later that I finally thought, oh, you know, I'm going to try one last time to send him an email and see if he'll let us do that story. And I did, and I finally got through to him. And so, yeah, now here we are. Well, how did you even get... The email address of a Mr. Fancy Pants like Scott Westerfeld. No, oh, that kind of stuff is easy to come by usually. You just go to their website and they'll have some way to give them comments and that kind of stuff. That wasn't that difficult. Usually you can get a hold of an author that way. Well, see, what I thought you had done is you called claiming to represent the estate of a long lost aunt he didn't know about who had just passed away. <laughs> and I did try that and it got me no further than the previous attempts. You know, a fancy pants like Scott Westerfeld doesn't need his aunt. As a matter of fact, he you know... He doesn't need our money. He doesn't, yeah. When when we offered to, uh, hey, here's the money that we give people for stories, he said, you know what? Donate that money to Reading is Fundamental and send me a receipt that what shows did... that you really did. Oh, really? Did you really <laughs> and say you that? didn't just say, oh, yeah, sure, we'll do that. <laughs> That's what I was going to tell you. <laughs> 
what, what, what do you know about reading as fundament? Fu- I, apparently, I'm not able to pronounce it, <laughs> but it's a, a charity. And what is its purpose? It is a charity that gets books to children so that they have the opportunity to read. Well, why would a kid need to read? It's all in the computer. That's right. It's in memory. Even porn. It's in the computer. (laughs) Oh, it's memory. There you go. You know, it's just one of those things that obviously... uh, What do you need a book for? You're four years old. (laughs) It's called Moby Dick by Herman Melville, and it's lovely. Moby what? It's one of those kind of charities that is out there to help underprivileged types that uh, don't get the opportunity to be read to, to get, you know, the immersion into reading. Because we know that reading is one of those skills. That is fundamental. It is. It's fundamental. If you can't read, it's really hard to get anywhere in life. And it's best to teach somebody to read while they're still young and, you know, catch them before they've learned coping mechanisms that can get them away and around it. You know, it's a worthy thing. I don't know. It's funny because <laughs> the first thing that came to mind when uh, he asked us, and I don't, I don't think this was even a reading as fundamental commercial, but there was this Saturday morning commercial, and I, I, I bet you remember it from when we were kids that used to always come on. And, yeah, he said, reading is fundamental. And I thought, oh, yeah, wasn't that Captain OG read more? And I can still remember the whole line. He's like, I'm Captain OG Readmore. My motto is tried and true. Read a book today and I bet you'll say, oh, gee, I'll, I'll read, read more, more too. too. But it, there's a lot of things like that yeah. that just burn in your memory. See, I haven't done enough drugs to expunge that from <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't go away. There's no, I don't think there is enough drugs to do to get that out. It's one of those jingle i mean there's so many jingles like that that just stick in your head and you can remember them word for word i mean how many times have we sang freaking tv themes jingles on this show not enough <laughs> more lines Street journal channel oh, no. never mind before not that one Who that's the cares? worst ever of richard a full-fledged <laughs> abomination it's interesting how that happens i think that was just some kind of like cbs program or you know one of their their own little things i don't think that was even actually reading as fundamental but for some reason it's connected in my head the, those two things so it might as well be reading as fundamental the invented captain og read more oh gee i'll read more too what is it that spoke to you about this story i mean besides the title <laughs> the, the greatest of all titles that's right and the the theme tune which it goes a little like this. As hot magic spider. I don't know how that, how did that start? Us singing the Ass Hat Magic Spider theme song. Well, like I said, this is so long in coming. It's like Sting on his wedding night. It's uh, (laughs) like Sting, I'm tantric. Like Snickers guaranteed to satisfy. No singing. It's uh, no stinging. (laughs) It's, no, uh, you didn't. <laughs> See, I said I wouldn't go there, and I went there. It's just, I, I remember you telling me about the title of the story years ago, before that beard of yours had any white in it. And uh, <laughs> I think I remember you calling me when he finally said that we could go ahead and do it. I, yeah, I don't know where it came from, but didn't, in didn't... my mind, it's a 70s, not Motown, but the urban black exploitation chicks singing... Has had magic spider, and you get some yeah. funky beat to you it. You need like Shirley from Community to, to really belt it out That's for you. Nice. <laughs> See, I don't. Yeah, I don't know where that song comes from, but I can't <laughs> stop doing it. If people want to listen to the outtakes of this episode, be prepared. <laughs> That's right. Because holy cow, at least ten times, and just in the middle of the story, <laughs> that song would burst out of us. Yeah, it cracked me up as I was editing it because I would be reading the line, just going along, blah 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 blah. I said magic spider, blah 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 blah, and I would just go right back into it without any break, without anything. It would just pop out. I just had to sing it or whatever. I don't know what the deal was with that, but yeah. If one of our listeners is musically talented, feel free to write an asshat magic spider song and we will play it on the show every week. 
But oh, I was asking you what spoke to you f- about this story. Well, there's a lot of things. I, I find it really interesting just the uh, idea of having to lose weight so that you can make that goal weight that you're trying to get to to get on the starship and be able to go. But I think what spoke to me about it much more was just the humanity of it, the real, the kindness. You, you don't expect it from this asshat magic spider that we're talking to this guy who is just so gruff and tough and you know he wants to snap that kid's skinny little ass in half and see if his insides are chewy like beef jerky or whatever you know he's and, and you, you told me to do it in that voice i did exactly and it, it it worked perfectly for stuff like saying i'm an asshat magic spider kid congratulations or whatever it just was yeah it, i, I really it liked it sometimes. i imagined it that way as i read it the first time i totally yeah i don't remember oh. when i edited the story the first time you're like oh, i'm an asshat magic spider kid i'm like no 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 you got to do it like this which was how I'd imagined it in my head when I read it. And I made you perform my imagination for me. I said, dance, monkey! <laughs> um, <laughs> On three, everybody make fun of Rish. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it really turned out nice. I really like that f- feeling that you get, you know, when you get like a kind of a gift. And I think that's the reason why we in the end decided to put it right before Christmas, too. Is it's just kind of like a, a giving of a gift that... Uh, that you didn't expect. And those are kind of the best gifts of all, really, when somebody sees something that you need and they give it to you, even though, you know, you had no hope of it happening or sometimes you didn't know even that you needed it, you know. But there it is, and you're just like, yes, that's what I needed. When I was a kid, as everybody was when they were kids, you know, it was all about you. If Christmas came around or... Hanukkah or whatever you may happen to life celebrate. Day. Life day. Time day. <laughs> Time daily. Sharon <Yeah>. Glass. <laughs> whatever uh, may be your thing, you know, you think about yourself. You're like, my gift. What am I going to get? You make your list out to Santa. I want this. I want this. I want, I want, I want, I want. At some point when you grow older... And you turn into like a super douche for a while. And you're just like, hey, I'm a teenager. And these clothes that you bought me aren't cool. Or whatever. But then you eventually grow out of that. Super douche. (laughs) And at some point, you finally realize, you grow up enough that you realize that it's not about you. And the best part of this season and the best part of this opportunity that you get to give people gifts is how much more fun it is to be able to see your own kids or you know whoever it is that you're giving the gift to and see the look on their face and see how excited they get when they get that thing like the look on your wife's face when you gave her that lexus with a bow on (laughs) that's right (laughs) when she went utterly insane because of it and ran off and wore the bow instead that's just the best part is to be able to see that look and see and to put the thought into it that it takes for that to be something special to them. You just go out on the 24th and be like, oh, let's see what's left. Oh, there's a set of commemorative plates. The special Occupy commemorative plates that have a painting of each different city that were occupied and all the different pro. Oh, that'll be perfect. <laughs> the special commemorative Heroes of the Third Reich plate set. That's it, Rish. Caroline Spurry just turned off the show. But yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it's much cooler to actually put some thought into it instead of just getting the same, you know, cologne gift basket every year or something, you know, finding something that people really like and actually making it not about yourself. And I think this story really kind of goes with that whole thing that makes this time of year a time of year that people really gravitate to and enjoy it's all about doing stuff for others it's about spending time with friends and family and listening to another version of blue christmas by another pop star you know i think rebecca black's cover of blue christmas is is the one that's going to be remembered yeah most definitely do you guys at work do the secret santa thing we don't do a secret Santa. We have a holiday... Secret p- non-denominational figurehead. <laughs> That's right. 
secret giver of presents. Uh, no, yeah, we just have a raffle, which I actually won this year, or at least you know one of the prizes I should say, not the big one, unfortunately, but I won a good one. That was nice. So the, the Lexus with the bow on it will be given to the winner of the Broken Mirror Story event, <laughs> courtesy of Bing Anklevich. When I worked at an office, we used to do this uh, Secret Santa uh-huh. thing. And if you're, I, I would imagine people are familiar with that. But if you're not, you draw a name out of a hat. And you are the secret gift giver to that person. And, and the way we would do it was, I think, the five days leading up to Christmas, you had to give a gift each day. And I think the point of it, it, it it's hard to say what the point of it was, just for fun, I guess. But I did it, th- I think, three years in a row. And it became a bigger and bigger, not a mystery, but like trying to figure out uh, who, who was the, who your person is. What's the word for that? It, it became almost a contest of, I'm going to figure out who my secret Santa is, and, and, and I'm going to leave clues for the person that's my recipient and all that, that if they, if they take to the crime scene investigation unit and put them <laughs> together in the right way, they will know who it is. Uh, I think the last year that I did it, I wrote a story uh, called The Adventures of Rosie the Reindeer because Rosie Figueroa was my recipient. And each day there was another like mini adventure of Rosie trying to protect the North Pole from like the Taliban and shit like that. <laughs> and as a reward, Santa would give her something. And that was the gift that I did. I mean, I went all freaking out on this. Um, but at the same time, she got a Lexus with a bow on top the last day. Huh? It was a Miata, but still. But at the same time, when I would come back to my desk from lunch and stuff, there would be a present there. And I can't remember what all five presents were, but I think like the fourth present was a garbage can, like a little plastic, you know, put it at mm-hmm. your desk garbage can. And the third day was a roll of toilet paper or Kleenex or something like that. And the second day was like hand lotion. It was like unscented, but I was just like, wow, do they think I'm a girl? What's the deal? Who, who, what guy uses hand lotion? And the last day I came to my desk and right there in a workplace environment, a huge stack of porn. (laughs) And it was my buddy's fiance or girlfriend at the time who had drawn my name. And she's just like, you know, this is going to be the funniest thing ever. And she made like a big deal. And so like everybody knew what I had gotten from my secret Santa. And they knew what all the other presents had been as well. And I'm trying to remember what the first one was. It might have been like rubber gloves or some awful <laughs> thing like that. I mean, yeah, I was the the butt of that joke. But it, everybody laughed and everybody remembered it. And I'm sure people still talk about that to this day. But just... And, and yeah, I, I, it boggles my mind that, that there'd just be this porn <laughs> right there where everybody could see it. <laughs> but uh, how did I get on that? Oh, it just, just it's, even, it's, it's better to give than receive. And it was so much fun to leave like the little clues and to see people trying to figure it out and asking other people if they knew who it was and stuff. And I, I miss that. That was really fun. Yeah, it's definitely one of the funnest parts. So I, we've done, you know, the, the I don't know if you've ever done a 12 days of Christmas kind of thing but it's similar to your secret santa thing where you'd pick somebody that you feel would enjoy this or would like to have gifts and then you just each day 12 days leading up towards christmas you leave a gift on their doorstep and run off after ringing the doorbell kind of a thing and like one of my favorite experiences was doing that to uh these girls that we knew in high school and it's it was just so funny to see how desperate they became to find out who was doing that you know it just gets to be like such a you know it's it's a mystery there like one time we gave them like a wreath and just to try and throw them off i had my sister write the note that went along with it so that it wouldn't look like you know a guy's writing or anything and i remember like the next day We're at school and we see these girls and they're like, hey, do you have a silver pen? Uh, no. They're like, okay, hey, write write something here for me. (laughs) (laughs) Provide a sample of my handwriting because they're trying to figure it out. Which was given to the CSI team. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Look at the number. And it was just so funny. And yeah, they just became so desperate. And in the end, 
And I was wondering about, I, I'm assuming with your Secret Santa thing, in the end you revealed yourself and said, I am the Secret Santa. Acting! Brilliant! <laughs> Thank you! Yeah, I, I'm assuming that you'd do that at the end. I don't know if that was the way it was or if you just left it a mystery and the person would never know. I think that they gave you the option. Oh. And, and what I did was... I still made it like a mystery and, and I had like a jumble of letters that spelled my first and last name and they were all cut up and they had to piece them together. But <laughs> I, I'm sure by then she knew who it was. And then she and, didn't care anymore. It's just like, ugh. <laughs> these frigging stories. The reason I went all out about it, uh, well, was because each year I tried to outdo myself. But when I was like 12 or 13... We were doing it in, in our little farming community, this this 12 Days of Christmas thing. Oh, uh -huh. Was it really 12? That's how I, we did it. I don't know that you always had to do it that in way. In this but... economy, could it be <laughs> maybe six? <laughs> but uh, the little farming community where I grew up was, and it may still be, made up almost entirely of old people, of, of retirement age people and beyond. Mm -hmm. People at death's door, basically. <laughs> And so there were all these like old couples or widows or brown recluses, things like that. <laughs> and I think that in our, our neighborhood, whatever you want to call it, they said, okay, well, every kid that wants to do this uh, will be given the name of a, an elderly person. And I remember I didn't want to do it. I was at that age. Me, me, me. Uh -huh. You know, uh, and my mom's like, oh, you know, we'll do this together. You know, I'll, I'll help you. We'll go to the grocery store. We'll go to the mall or whatever. And we'll buy these 12 presents and I'll drive you over and, and we'll drop them off. And, and I was like, oh, can I like ring the doorbell or kick on the door? And then we run away. <laughs> and my mom said, well, she's very old. You, you don't want to do that. And I was like, oh, but this is going to be so stupid, mom. I don't want to do this. And she's like, well, well, you're a creative person. How about if you write a poem each day? that like describes what the present is or something. And I was like, this might be kind of fun. So I did. I wrote a poem. I, I Was it really 12? Wow, that <laughs> blows my mind that I would have, that like a 14-year-old me would have written 12 poems. But yeah, I would do it and I would... Uh, Not for a girl you had a crush on, but just for some old lady. Right. It was for this old <laughs> widow. It would just be like a little thing, like a two liter of Sprite or peanuts or something like that. I think they told us we were only supposed to spend like $15 max or mm -hmm. I don't know. A used car was the last day. It couldn't be a new one. A moped maybe. And so I did one. this every single night. And I think I, I ran out of energy after like the fourth or fifth day and I just didn't want to do it anymore. And my mom's like, oh, you know, you'll regret it if you don't. And you know what that age was like. Mm -hmm. Even if you knew your parents were right, you wanted to prove them wrong. You wanted <laughs> them to be wrong. But she, she, my mom was always able to manipulate me. She still sort of is. And she just gave me this, you know, well, I hope that when I'm an old lady, somebody <laughs> would care enough. And I'd be like, oh, crap. Okay. And so every, every day I did it and we, we put these things out. And then in the last day, I, you know, revealed my name. And, and this woman was 60 years older than me. Or more so there's no way she would know who I was but but you know I, I heard my mom say or my dad say or my, my, my grandparents were alive back then so they probably said that you know oh, she really liked that she really appreciated that and uh, when I was like 17 or 18 this old lady died and they used to have anybody who was musically talented <laughs> oh, sorry that that's going way far about when we're talking about <laughs> me I had tried to be in the band in elementary school and so they would have anybody who could play the trumpet try and play taps at these funerals. And so I had to play taps. Was this at, woman a retired military? Or? No, it was just something that they did for the huh, old people. Interesting. I know this is a long story, but <laughs> the asset thing was really short. I went to the funeral to play the trumpet. And after the funeral, this old lady's daughter, who was like 50, came up to me and she said, you were that boy that wrote all those poems to my mom. And I was like, oh, for the, for the Christmas thing. Yeah, it's like, how do you know about that? She's like, she used to talk about that all the time. She kept all those poems. And I guess she had mentioned it, or my mom had mentioned it to the daughter or something like that. And the, the daughter knew who I was because of that. But it was one of those weird things where it's like my mom's words came back to haunt me or whatever <laughs> early. And I just I was like, what that silly, stupid Christmas thing really meant something to this old lady enough that 
after she was gone, it was mentioned, you know, but that was, that was really cool. And, and I'm sure that that's where the tendency or the, the, the feeling uh, for me to just go all out. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I never bought anybody a stack of porn. I'll give you that. So you didn't really but, go all out. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, in, in that way, I guess, you know, the, it, it feels better to give than receive. And I suppose when you got a really, really old lady, they're not going to be as desperate to find out. Um, but yeah, the whole investigative thing where people are just trying to find you out and they, you know, they're waiting. The longer it goes, you have to ring that doorbell and absolutely haul ass out of there because they are just waiting to pull that door open as fast as they can and see who that is. And they'll chase you down the street sometimes. And, you know, like the last day when we finally revealed ourselves and we came over and everything, we sang a Christmas song to them or whatever. And, yeah, I remember their mom saying, it was crazy. Like, the doorbell would ring and you would just hear thundering footsteps running down the stairs as they're trying to get out there and find out who it was. And uh, I remember a friend (laughs) was telling me that he had done the same kind of a thing to a neighbor of his the guy <laughs> had gotten so desperate to find out. He was like setting traps for them. He was like up on his roof with like a hose or something trying to like catch these people somehow. And he's like in the middle of like climbing up onto his roof when they do it. And he's like, ah, who are you? Like screaming at them as they run away. It's just one of those memories that I really enjoy from uh, Christmas times. Looking back on that, just have fun giving, not receiving. It's a good good thing about the holidays. And going back to the story itself, one of those things that speaks to me about it is just like he said in the author's note, you know, the whole getting on the scale and seeing pounds come and go from you like subway trains as you as you go through the day. It's an interesting experience that I've had recently as far as that goes because, you know, I've been trying to become more healthy and lose the tons of extra pounds that I gained over the years <laughs> I've become one of those folks I've got the scale and you know when you eat something what's going to stick with you what's going to go when's the best time of day to weigh yourself to feel good about yourself you know so I always tried to weigh myself like right when I get up in the morning you know before I've eaten breakfast or anything like that because I know that if I eat breakfast then I'll have I don't know another pound of food that just is sitting there in my stomach if you weighed yourself right before you went to sleep and then weighed yourself again when you got up, there would be a difference? There often is, yeah. Just um, from farting <laughs> it away? Or where, where does that – you burn calories by sleeping? Is I'm that what you're telling me? I'm not sure exactly how it works. To tell you the truth, I know that you burn calories uh, just being alive for one thing, you know, making your heart beat the whole time, making your, all your different organs do their thing. All that kind of stuff requires energy, and they, that's what they call the metabolism. And you hear people always say, oh, this guy has a high metabolism, and so he can eat anything. And then other people have low metabolism, and that whole thing is something that you're trying to jigger with. Warning. <laughs> the J word. Wait, you never said J word. Generally, you know, muscle uses calories. Fat does not. If you can get more muscle, then you'll burn more calories just being alive, because I don't know if you've ever done this, and I, I'm pretty sure you have. You get on the treadmill, for example, and you run on it, and you have all the different readouts. It'll tell you like how far you've gone, et cetera, and one of them is like how many calories you've burned. And you could run for like you know a half hour, and you get done, and you look at it, and it's like you burned 300 calories. And then you look at like one Snickers bar, 300 calories, one, and. Obviously, you're not going to get through a day eating one Snickers bar and nothing else. A guy my size eats at least 2,000 calories. And you run on a treadmill for like an hour and you burn 500 if you're lucky. How, how much does a Baconator have in it? <laughs> I'm sure it's got probably more than 1,000 all by itself. I don't know for sure. But uh, it's one of those things, the, the weight coming and going. So that speaks to you. It does. It's just, it's an interesting thing. The desperation of this poor, poor kid. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, I was thinking about like the dead skin that's around your ankles (laughs) or whatever. Yeah, you rub that off. Is that going to weigh something? Sit down and get the the, the little fingernail file thing and like use that on any calluses you have. See if you can file them down. And that's another thing, a question that might need to be asked. 
what would you be willing to lose weight for to be able to bring with you on the starship when you go to colonize the other world? Oh, geez. Well, I don't have a cool answer for it. Yeah. Because it's not like my vintage firing rocket Boba Fett, <laughs> the one that actually killed the child, according to legend, even uh-huh. though they never made any. But if it had to be a book that you were taking, what would the book be? Um, is, there, is there a book that means to you what Charlotte's Web meant to... Did he have a name? To you? <laughs> I don't know if he had a name. Uh, you know, if I had to choose a book... Perhaps one of my favorite books that I'd really want to have would be maybe Ender's Game, which is one that really spoke to me a lot. I'm not sure if I can think of one that would take a higher place than that as far as books go. I mean, what about you? My favorite book is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, and that's the book I would take with me. Interesting that you would put that in the Christmas episode. Hmm. Because you could uh, cart it out and read it. With your family or whatever, you know, Marley was dead to begin with every Christmas. I just that I love that book so much and I never get tired of it. And you should because the story has been told more than any other, especially around the holidays. There's always one version or 10 on (laughs) cable or or some awful sitcom doing their version of that. Right. Mr. Magoo doing their version. Yeah, Mr. Magoo did one. I remember that. (laughs) The Simpsons doing their parody of the Mr. Magoo. Really? (laughs) They had one where where Homer watches. He's like, oh my gosh, it was the greatest thing, the most interesting story ever. And everybody's like, Dad, how did you not know this story? (laughs) Everybody does this story. Now that you say that, another book that's one of my favorites is Great Expectations. G R A T E <laughs> expectations by the famous Dutch author Edmund Wells. That's the one, yes. But yeah, I don't know if it can top Ender's Game though. See, so yeah, when I read Ender's Game, it was about the same age as when I read Great Expectations for the first time. But Ender's Game definitely spoke to a, a young a high school age boy much more than Great Expectations did. It took a little more. Uh, maturity before i could finally really understand oh and it also took frank muller to help me along the way i have listened to a reading of it by him which was absolutely awesome but speaking of christmas carol there's a guy that got together a bunch of podcasters and he split up a christmas carol into like 12 or 15 or three parts and had everybody who wanted to volunteer to read a part take a part and then a section. A section. There there you go. Of the book and read it. And then I guess he was going to edit it all together. And I'm assuming with m- music or maybe that's too much of an assumption. Maybe I'm making an ass hat out of you and umption. That's listenable. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know where it is or anything like that. But can we put the link to that in the show notes? And I did the uh, the, the part where they had the big meal at the Cratchit's house. And Bob Cratchit says to Ebenezer Scrooge, the founder of the feast. And Mrs. Cratchit says, founder of the feast, indeed. If I had him here, I'd give him a piece of my mind and I hope he had a good appetite for it. Martha, it's Christmas. (laughs) That part. Anyhow, I just thought that was really cool to get to be a part of that. That is cool. Considering that it's your favorite book of all time, that's especially (laughs) cool. You can switch it up every year and watch it different adaptation of that yeah you could watch jim carrey's uh, computer animated version this year if you'd like all right or (laughs) you could watch mickey's christmas carol i know we probably use this word too much but that's the seminal version uh watch your language of that story for me as mickey's christmas carol i know that was the last time that clarence nash did the voice of uh, donald duck was uh, mickey's christmas carol yeah 83 or 84 that, that reminds me, over at uh, Journey Into, didn't Marshall have sort of a Christmas Carol type story that he had us read? Oh, yeah, that's right. We we did a part in his uh, Christmas E story. It's called Mansion? The Mansion or Mansion. Mansions. The Haunted Mansion? Something to do with the mansion. Mansion. But it's very similar. It's kind of a... Uh, it's kind of like an uh, uber-Christian version of that. But father... I played this pontificating rich man who's always trying to teach his grown son life lessons about how important storing up treasures on earth is. <laughs> and then, you know, I pass away and we get to find out that uh, I reaped what I sowed or something like that. 
and that's over at uh, Journey, Journey into, into Podcast. Podcast. Blogspot.com. That's right. Check show it notes out. in the show notes. Uh, this is probably a good time to just wrap up. I, it's really cool that Scott would uh, let us do this story. I, I mean, he is a big deal, right? Uh, he's a fairly big deal. I mean, I don't know how that kind of stuff works, but he does this for a living. I've read several of his books. Uh, yeah. Although I was introduced to Scott Westerfield through this story. I uh, sought out some of his stuff, and I read several of them, including some that we didn't even mention in his intro, but uh, he's got a steampunk series. Steampunk alternate history, right? Or wait, is or does steampunk necessitate that it's alternate I history? I think it does necessitate that it's alternate history. But this is a steampunk World War I retelling, which I, I found really interesting. It's got some really cool stuff in it. And now is that called the Leviathan Trilogy or is the first book Leviathan and it's called something else? I would call it the Leviathan Trilogy, but I don't know if it has a real name or, you know, an overarching name to it. Now that's something that you and I have both read. Well, I'm, I'm almost done with Leviathan. I, I thought that I could have read it before we did this episode so that I could talk with some experience, some knowledge, some authority. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, he's created a detailed, fantastic, fascinating world of the past. The worst thing about it is that it makes me want to know more about World War I. And I've never <laughs> given a crap about World War I. <laughs> yeah, it's not the interesting of the two world wars. It's the one that we care less about. Is more the dying of the uh, empires from the century before than it is about its own little thing, you know, and you don't have the clear, obvious bad guys and the Nazis doing just absolutely horrendous things. And so, yeah, it's harder to just point a finger at somebody and say, bad guys, good guys. That it's just a bunch of empires giving their death throes before we move into the modern world. It's possible that there were atrocities right and left, but they weren't as well publicized as the World War II yeah. ones. The thing that you hear the most about of the whole... World War One is just the Western Front and how just utterly wasteful and useless it was. Okay, let's make another surge over the trench. It's time to try. And they'd send a few thousand more people to their death. Well, see, they needed AT-ATs. <laughs> there you go. Apparently to make they needed AT-ATs and flying whales. The whole Darwinist side of it absolutely fascinates me, uh, Ooh, I don't know what they call it. They have a word that they use in the book that won't come to my mind, but this the flying whale that is the ship is just like a whole ecosphere or whatever of creatures that are involved in the upkeep and so Maybe forth. Maybe it's a biosphere? Yeah, biosphere. Um, Biodome. You take that back, sir. <laughs> you know, what I started uh, reading recently is his uglies, pretty specials, etc., Oh, wait, extras, et cetera, is a different word that's not quite used. But that whole uh, series that he's got, I'm enjoying my uh, way through it. I uh, finished Uglies last week, and I'm now reading Pretties. Uh, we've been going for a long time. Uh, last week's episode was pretty short, and so this one, uh, we gave you a little bit more. Like it matters. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope you're enjoying the holiday season, and I hope you're giving with your heart. And not with your ass. <laughs> yeah, like Rish has been doing all night long. You, all right? I learned it by watching you. <laughs> but, and also check out Scott's stuff. Uh, like we said, he's got lots of books out there, and they're all pretty cool. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I did, should we ask for donations now? Yeah. Didn't need, I promise I would ask for donations? Every you did week? promise you would every week, so get to it. All right. Well, hey, it was uh, it was great to be able to run this story, and we'd like to be able to run another story next time and the time after that into this new year. Uh, and the only way we can do that is if people donate to the show. They don't have to donate a lot. They can donate a little. It goes a long way, really. And... Uh, Apparently, it's time for your wife to get up for work. Hold on a sec. Yes, hat magic spider. Okay, keep going. Uh, we really do appreciate the donations, and they help us feel appreciated so that we're willing to do this 
until quarter to 3 a.m. once again. <laughs> How would we be able to donate to Reading is Fundamental if you guys didn't donate that money to us in the first place? Don't tell him that. <laughs> tell him it came out of your children's college fund or the money that you set aside for burial expenses <laughs> in case of a horrific accident. We used that instead. Oh, 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 one thing before we go also is the Broken Mirror event is still going on. Yeah, it's going on until the 12th of January. 12th of January, you have to write up a story with the following prompt. Someone arrives in town. <laughs> Not that again. That joke never works. And now for something we hope you really like. How many times have we done that? <laughs> We've done that one a lot recently, especially. The phone, the phone rings. rings. The phone rings in the middle of the night. The guy on the other end only says one word. And the word is, Ass Hat Magic Spider! Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, wait, sorry. We're really throwing this off. The phone rings in the middle of the night. The person on the other end only says one word, but it is enough. So that's your prompt. Write a story that has something to do with that and send it in. Every story will be published on the website so that you can say, hey, check this out. I got published. And everybody can read all those stories and get the same joy from seeing all the different takes that all the different applicants have spun onto that same idea. And winning stories will be uh, podcast as episodes of our show. If you're a writer, if nothing else, it's a way to keep yourself writing. Because that's important. That's how you become a better writer. We've talked a lot about that in the last year or two. And I'm sure next week, when it's our New Year's episode, we'll talk about, Oh, Big, I promised to write more in 2012 than I did in 2011. <laughs> and you'll know it's a lie, but we'll still make that promise because we always do. I actually probably did, at least this year. Just writing a couple stories is more in 2011 than I did in 2010 because I think I wrote nothing. Plus, you're going to write a broken mirror story. There you go. Right? Mm-hmm. And then I guess I will, too, even though I can't come up with one. Right <laughs> yeah, now. I can't come up with anything either. Um, I'm running low on time already. I don't know. These are all things to talk about in, in another time. If you were uh, someplace... With a family and, and you, you have some kind of holiday to celebrate, I hope that this story made you smile. I hope that we, our show, has made you smile. It's uh, fairly fun to do. Yeah. So it's, it's sometimes fun to do. Okay, occasionally it can be one time it was fun. Yes, there was that one time. <laughs> All right. Hey, happy Christmas, announcer man. Cheers, guys. Happy Christmas, Harry. Happy Christmas, Hermione. Come here. Um... Happy holidays, everybody. This has been Rich Outfield. <laughs> and I've been Big Anglovich. Asshead Magic Spider! Thanks for listening to The Dune Steve. The Dune Unbelievable! The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone. But you cannot change it or make money off it. Take two. Warning. Today's episode contains singing. You know, my favorite part of that song always was, was the part where they get to the steel drums going. I didn't even know what the crap kind of an instrument could even make a sound like that when I was a kid. But it sure was something special. It was your buttocks. Ass hat magic spider. Ass hat magic spider. Ass hat magic spider. Oh yeah. Ass hat magic spider by Scott Westerfeld. Sing it. Ass hat magic spider by Scott Westerfeld. Down. Coming up next on Ass hat magic spider. Coming up next on the Ass Hat Magic Spider Hour. That's right. The Ass Hat Magic Variety Special. <laughs> Featuring Captain and Tennille, Sean Cassidy, and special guest Jermaine Jackson. Wow, it's an oh, it's a star studded night. Okay. <clears throat> there on that stair climber, I imagine myself a Bedouin crossing the Sahara. 
feel like I'm out of breath for some reason. Because you are fat. That's probably it. And I knew it was about 100% certain I'd never see the Sahara. Are you farting? No, oh, it's what you called the wind before. It was it's the really chair, like I've, I bet. The home. dead trying to get into the house. The dead of Tetramana. The dead of Tetramana. Me and Charlotte were still 1,700 grams overweight. Crap. Ass hat magic spider. Maybe that's what he needs to do is crap. That's, that's what I it. Did. What a plan. That's what I thought about. <clears throat> if he was just a tiny bit over, he's like, well, go throw up. Go take a dump. Hurry. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, he's already. you'll see that he's already beyond that point. He's done everything he can. He can't even spit or cry. They'd hook me up to an IV and pump me back to hydration. Maybe add as much as half a kilo of water and sugar to my mass. And that would mean leaving Charlotte behind. That's that magic spider! Two hours before the... <laughs> no, I just thought about when we do this episode of splicing those in all the time. Like I'd splice in an outer man lines. <laughs> just, I mean, we could do it like... The voices that sing Wanda Wilman. So it's like yeah. sounds like black women <laughs> saying S hat magic spatter. No, we need do 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 That would be so cool. Some kind of really eighties sounding uh, interstitial music. I'm sure you could find that in gra- garage band. <laughs> I was still screwed. The hair had to go. Do 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 hair on my penis. You know, most guys don't have hair on their penis. I think that's kind of disturbing. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's in just in the general area. It's not actually on. Just just on the head. You're like, Ew, really? <laughs> it's called a head. That's head magic spider. Wait, do you remember the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? I think that ended with... We should... I bet you you could find We should YouTube that now so we can get the tune exactly in our head. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Has had magic spider. Do 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 A horrible fish boy stared back at me, an appalled expression on his face. Do 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 do. Has had magic spider. Yeah. He snorted. Whoa. I don't think he snorts quite so piggishly. <laughs> You're all smart and stuff. Passed all those tests. What do you think dehydrated guts would look like? I think you're an asshat, I said. <clears throat> Let me say that a little louder. It's the pivotal line of the yes. story. Very necessary. 15 grams over. Fly buzzing right on my face. Okay, you're going to die, Fly. Keep it up. Circling my head. I can't <laughs> read like this. You know what you need to take care I of I just all can't these work flies? like this. <laughs> what? I'll say it again. You know what you need to take care of all these flies? What? An ass hat magic spider. Oh, that could be helpful. But I was too dehydrated to turn my anger and shame into salt water. Salt traps water weight. Yeah? S hat magic spider! Spider man. And I hadn't eaten anything salty in a month. It'll be in the ship's memory, even if it's porn. It's not porn. And it's not the same in memory. He pulled it from me again and flipped through the pages. Sorry, did you hear me? Realizing what the book was. <laughs> oh, you're just now realizing? I figured you figured it out earlier. How? Because it's Charlotte and it's a book that uh, ah. you would have gotten it before now. 
the pig is going to get eaten at Christmas, and the spider makes a web saying it's great. It's for walking? The pig, he'd be damned if he got eaten at Christmas. Getting eaten at Christmas was his birthright. Doesn't matter. I closed my eyes, wondering if ripping off just the back cover would be enough. No tear is going to weigh 15 grams. It is a shame about those blank pages at the end. <laughs> Just get rid of them. <laughs> he and fellow writer Justine Larbalestier. Larbalestier? Holy crap, holy. How do you say that name? Say, well, I mean, it could be Larbale Steer. Larb. Larbale. Larbale. Larbalisteer. Larbalisteer. There you go. Okay, we'll say that. Holy crap, holy. That's a hard to say name. Ass Hat Magic Spider. You know what's weird is Jeff has those books, Pretties and Uglies. Yeah. So. Yeah. I've read uh, So Yesterday, and we had peeps I got from the library, and he's got a couple others that aren't on this list that I have read, which are the, uh, there's one called, uh, the, the first book in the trilogy is, not Behemoth, that's the second book. The first one was, uh, crap, I can't, another word for a very large creature that lives underwater. And they have... Starts with a V, huh? Leviathan. Leviathan, there you go. Leviathan was the name of the first book, and then Behemoth is the second book. Third one hasn't come out yet. But it's got... They're read by Alan Cumming. And Cumming and Cumming. I don't think I could listen to an uh, an audio book read by Alan Cumming. Yeah, he does a good job. It's not bad. What does this story have in common with... Anacoinosis by Tobias Bakel and Sides by Clay Duggar. Wow. Um, well, they're on the Dynasty Fighting of Fiction. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's that. I don't know. No, I was going to say it's just long, long time in coming episode. Uh, it's been a long time, long time, long time coming. Yes, That's an anthrax song. Anyways, yeah, uh, it has been a long time coming. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you the whole full story after the uh, full story is over. <laughs> oh, that's right, because people don't like to listen to us, so we leave that for after. Yes, we do that's usually do that. brilliant. Who, who came up with that idea? Uh, I think it was Announcer Man. Announcer Man? Really? That He's also the brains behind the old operation. Isn't that true, Announcer Man? Don Pardo ain't got nothing on me. That, that, that is also true? Yes, it is. How about you guys tell me about today's author? Uh, and of course, that is already recorded. Mm-hmm. And we don't need to say Author's who produced note. a story. Author's note is also already recorded. Uh. I don't know. I, the, the, the book thing is kind of interesting. But, I, you know, I have to lean toward the wearer's point of view. If, if you could just watch it on the 25th century equivalent of a Kindle, why do you really need the book? But... There are people that like to heft them, that like to have the things in their hands. And I understand that. And, I, you know, 50 years from now or 100 years from now, at some point, somebody somewhere is going to say no more trees are going to be cut down for books. It'll probably be newspapers first before well, yeah. books. Well, newspapers are going to go away on their own. But they'll just be saying, OK, you know, this is wasteful or this, you know, it's it's so much easier just to read it on your QPod whatever it's called. And yeah, books are going to mean something. In in Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, Spock gives Kirk a copy of A Tale of Two Cities on his 50th birthday. You know, it's just like, it's a big deal because it's an actual book. And that's, you know, what, the 23rd century. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see how things shake out because the whole ebook thing is a relatively new phenomenon. And uh, it's still working its way into society but uh you know we'll have to see where that goes and how prolific it becomes i know that there are some people that yeah definitely want a book in their hands they don't like to read off a screen or whatever and i can understand that definitely and you know depending on the screen you're reading off of especially i've not gotten a kindle or a nook or any of those things yet but 
can definitely understand the uh, the idea. I mean, when when I read stories for the show, people email them to us, and I could sit in front of the computer screen and read all 5,000 words off of the computer screen, but I generally don't do that. Instead, I'll print the story out and then put it by my bedside table and read it as I'm going to bed at night or something like that. I prefer that too. I like it when you hand it out to me. That's something that we always, well, not always, but I like to do that with our stories. Print it out, and that way I can make notes on it or whatever and then give it back to you. I don't know if you just throw those away, but no, there's something do. cool about one from 15 years ago or something like that. And yeah. It's like, wow, I, you know, and this is my handwritten notes from whatever 15 years ago was, 1972. I, I, I don't know. What else you got to plug? Just a butt plug. <laughs> you are... <laughs> <laughs> I could use one because oh. on Leviathan I've gotten to the part where Alec you know her name Darren, Darren or Devin depending on have, have just met and they're going to go back to the, the castle under a flag of truce you know what I'm talking about you mm-hmm. recently read it I do remember yeah, they go and get like the, the stories or whatever from there and that, that's where I am, so it's probably two-thirds of the way. It's through. a really interesting and very well-imagined world, though, don't you think? The Klanka side of it is more or less standard kind of, uh, although the walkers, I don't know where that You came know from. what I thought I mean, of you know it comes rock, from rock. probably a, a Empire Strikes Back kind I of a totally mentality. I totally thought of, of the Imperial walkers. I mean, the way they describe it and all that, it just, yeah, it feels like they're in an ad hat. Gosh, the stuff with the whole Darwinist side where they've got like all these little creatures that do all these different things and they got the friggin' message lizards that you talk to and then they scurry over and then just replay whatever it is that they heard. And like, the intro, I don't know if this has ever happened in, yet in any of the uh, parts that you've heard, but like the Leviathan gets hit or something and there's a big shake and one of these message lizards gets knocked off and it's falling through the air and it'll start just spewing gibberish out is basically the scream that it gives as it's falling to its death it's just like mr shop starts yelling like different things like that as it falls it's just great really interesting stuff that whole biosphere whatever they say they keep saying that the leviathan is more than just a ship it's like a whole are we just talking you and me it seems like we are maybe we ought to make this more if we want to talk about it and we need to make it like we're talking about it. Otherwise, we can just cut all that. We weren't talking about it, so. Oh, <laughs> Hi, everybody. O oh, eight O T here. The rest of these outtakes come from a story that Rish read for Podcastle. Since they don't do outtakes on their show, we included them here for you. Hope you enjoy it. He stared numbly at the linoleum floor of his apartment's walk-in closet. Kitchen. He stared numbly at the linoleum floor of his apartment's watch- walk-in... Cl- walk-in. Walk-in kitchen. Kitchen. <laughs> what is a walk-in kitchen? Don't you walk into any kitchen? Yeah, you should. What kind of a place has a non-walk-in kitchen? I'm sure I don't know. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but there's no, that you cannot spell it that way. F-A-I-R-Y or F-A-E... R I E. Otherwise, F U. Hey, you tell that to Abby Hilton. She's the one that came up with F A E R I Y J. <laughs> okay. Abby Hilton, F U. <laughs> She's one of the three people that donates to our show. We probably should take that back. Oh, yeah. I take that back. You can spell fairy however you like, dear. That his wife was gone. 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 Gone, daddy, gone. Your love is gone. It's gone, daddy, gone. Your, Your love is gone away. It's probably the best xylophone song ever. You take that back, son. <laughs> She'd always had her heads in the clouds, though. Head. Good point. She'd always had her heads in the... <laughs> no. Head. When he got back home and found that his landlord had raised the rent to 3000 a month, a portal finder special, his landlord cried, as if the portal had been... 
What kind of voice should I do for that? That's good. A portal finder special. His I want you to do Gilbert Godfrey. A portal finder special. His landlord cried. More shrieky. But what about your family? I need more uh, nasal to it. A portal finder special. <laughs> that that was Gilbert Godfrey. Okay, that's pretty good. I think I'm making a funny face in it. I I can't be sure. Would you? She drew her hand away, massaging her wrist. Yeah, she said. Massaging? What did I say? You said massaging. That's how I say it. Massaging. Isn't that how you say massage? Okay. I don't, but Hmm. I say sabotage. (laughs) Fung you. Each way. They're identical Elmrid. They're I. That's a good new word. They're identical em, <laughs> emerald. They're identical emerald leaves waved like tiny dancers in the wind. Sing, Sing it. it. Hold me closer, tiny dancer. I don't know how the. Th- I don't know the song either. I'm not an Elton oh John fan. I'm afraid. Away. Lay me down. Uh, she was so lean and- as Malcolm pulled up fist-sized... Well, that's what the, how the song... Hold me closer, time to dance. Sorry. Count the headlights on the highway. Okay, don't sing it. There. I broke the spell. Lay me down in sheets <laughs> no, of No, no, I broke the spell. It's over. I had a busy day today. <laughs> sing another note and I walk. This isn't even your show. Okay. That's the thing that I hate. Why would you take a perfectly good thing, like give the best he could give them, and change it to something longer, gift them with? Ooh. Why must I kill you? I didn't write it. You mustn't. (laughs) But I will. I've got it coming after what I did to your granddaughter. It's a fair cop. (laughs) It is. Ugh. Was he a salmon or a maiden? A crow or a lurching tree? Or a giant fart. You monster. And he could give up himself for the world, doing penitence for the lost love of Julianne. Penitent man is humble before God. Penitent man kneels before God. Penitent man, penitent. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.